people keep saying that they're really thankful that I've come along to today and, and I'm actually really delighted to have the opportunity to come along, not just because I'm a huge supporter of CCS and this project in particular, um, but because it's an opportunity to talk about something other than Brexit. <laughs> and as, a, as an MP, it's been quite Brexit focused in recent times, so it's nice to have the opportunity to talk about something else. Um, I just want to briefly talk, just say a couple of things about the project before um, we allow you the chance to ask your questions of the panel. I'm from the northeast of Scotland, and obviously this is a project that is looking to be run in the northeast of Scotland. I think what this project so far has done is shown not just the viability of the project going ahead, but the desirability of the project going ahead as well. As somebody from, from the northeast, from Aberdeen, I'm going to fight for my region at every opportunity, and I think that there are huge benefits to having this project in the northeast. We've covered the benefits in relation to the pipelines, which I think are, are massive and can't be understated. But but the other benefits are about the level of expertise that we have, um, who are already used to working out of Aberdeen, wherever it was that they were they were actually born. People are used to working out of Aberdeen on this, and I think that you know we've we've got that subsea expertise that you would need in order to take this this pipeline forward. So as I say, I've been a, a massive supporter of this this project all the way all the way along, and it's something that it's it's quite nice to have something to be enthusiastic about just now, um, you know, given the the Brexit context that we have. The three people that we've got on the panel. We have Alan James, who you've heard from already, from uh, Pale Blue Dot Energy. We've got Keith Risky, again, who you've heard from before, already from Bellona Europe, and Peter Brownsort from the Scottish Carbon Capture and Storage. The cost that we talked about there did not include any, uh, any steam reformation of natural gas, so that would be part of the build-out that we're envisaging. Um, but you're right, there is interest in, a growing interest in hydrogen in particular. And it's, it's, it's partly being driven by the recognition that two-thirds, three-quarters of our emissions are not to do with electricity generation. They're to do with heat and transport. And hydrogen is potentially an important vector to help uh, us move into decarbonizing that space. And that provides you with a big challenge of generating bulk hydrogen um, quickly. And steam methane reformation is a mechanism to start that in the fullness of time. That will all be driven by renewables and electrolysis. But at the moment, the cost curve suggests that steam methane reformation is, is more cost effective. So that is uh, a big driver for some of the investor interest that's coming through now. Uh, just uh, you mentioned that there was kind of growing uh, interest. So just to put the um, UK projects in uh, European uh, perspective, so um, uh, the Netherlands now is required to meet its uh, Paris agreements. Uh, in reality, not on paper, uh, they lost a court case against an environmental NGO. So that means that they currently had a period of roundtables to discuss how much CO2 they have to reduce from each sector of their economy. The surprising answer to that was that the biggest reductions actually have to come from industry. So exactly like this, the conversation is turning away from power that seems to be becoming a solved problem, and now industry is rising to the top. In the Netherlands, that's steel and chemicals primarily, and refining. Uh, the plan is currently, as it's being developed, is about 7 million tonnes to be captured every year in the Netherlands by 2030 from industry alone. Uh, in Norway, there's uh, two projects currently progressing, one from a cement plant to capture just under a million tonnes of CO2 a year, and a waste incinerator just outside the city of Oslo that emits about 20% of Oslo's emissions. So again, once you have these targets of reducing emissions by 30, 40, 50%, you start hitting the bone and you get to these very difficult to decarbonize areas. And that's when you start looking at industry, and that's high employment and difficult to decarbonize, but CO2 transport and storage can give you much more options about how you approach that problem. I may just add to that, in terms of using hydrogen in industry, um, hydrogen is one of the, perhaps, the lowest barrier ways of moving from uh, natural gas consumption in industry into uh, a low carbon uh, energy source in industry. Because in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, uh, you don't actually need to change terribly much the technology. The burner technology may have to change, but uh, it, it's still a, a gas that can be used in similar types of way to natural gas currently. So there's a big scope for um, all the high heat requirements in industry to be uh, potentially changed to hydrogen over a period of time as hydrogen supplies in the grid become available. So that's a part of the market draw there. Well, it is fair to say that Feeder 10 is a regulated asset and conversations have uh, started to explore with na National Grid 
how such an asset may be moved from the natural gas uh, regulated system into a different environment. And you know, this is something that National Grid have been through in a huge amount of detail previously, so it's not a new discussion for Nation National Grid. There's all kinds of different options open at the moment, and National Grid have, have operated the pipeline for many years in gas and phase, and they've also, you know, in the past expressed an interest in operating it as a CO2 transportation system. So, you know, all of those things are possible. But the conversations are ongoing on that. Just in terms of the status of the decommissioning plan for the GoldenEye line, uh, you probably know this, but the plan has gone out for cons consultation and presumably then it goes back into Bayes and will be agreed uh, or not agreed as the case may be. But the plan for the pipeline is to cut it and flange it, uh, leaving it preserved so it can be reused for uh, CCS in the future for the for the GoldenEye pipeline, that, and that's the current plan. We've responded to the consultation. I know Alan has as well. Um, so for the GoldenEye pipeline, that's probably the best we can hope for at the moment. Um, but the Atlantic pipeline is still at risk because its to meet decommissioning plan doesn't have that cutting and flanging. It just has a cut and leave open. Um, so that would then lead to deterioration of the pipeline. So that's the one we probably need to be more. Uh, concerned about. In terms of the platform, I'll maybe pass that to, well, Alan or Keith, I'm not sure. Um, so uh, I think the uh, on the platform issue, um, what you have to bear in mind, of course, is that the uh, cost of doing offshore modifications on a platform that, even if it's unmanned, but you put people on from time to time, if it's handling CO2, the cost of that uh, brownfield redevelopment is very high in itself. So, you know, the, the project fairly early on adopted what our colleagues in Norway call the Norwegian model, which is where the, uh, the system is all operated from the beach with no platform. Uh, it's the technology that's used in the Snovit project. It's a technology that is planned to be used for um, the Northern Lights project as well. And that helps us avoid the complexities around the platform modification costs. And, you know, the, 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 wells, the wells on platforms are optimally designed to be producing gas. What we need them to do is to be optimally designed for injecting CO2. And whilst there is an overlap between the two, uh, you, you, know, you would design them to be slightly different. Um, but, uh, you know, I think also the, the costs that we're looking at here are significantly lower than the published cost for the um, doing something with the pipeline that, that were part of the uh, knowledge transition package from the, the competition work. And that, that's part of the driver here is to reduce those costs. And just, just on that, I mean, the benefits for, it feels like to me, for, for my constituents and for people who work offshore is that they don't have to go in helicopters to go and do this kind of incredibly dangerous work that they currently do. And actually, you know, I think that it can still generate jobs without having people to have to be offshore on those platforms, which I'm regularly um, informed by those people that go offshore that it is an incredibly dangerous job and they're very keen to make that point to me. So I think there's the benefit of that as well. And the other thing that, um, that wasn't particularly mentioned earlier is about the CO2 benefits of not building the new pipeline. So the actual pipeline itself would cost a lot of CO2 to build all of that metal that you need and the, the work to put that in. So actually you're saving CO2 as well as the massive cost saving from not having the, um, the pipeline being built. Well, I think the, the whole issue around um, CCS and the business model and who pays for it is uh, central to uh, all of this. And, uh, you know, whilst it, it can be great to try and imagine ourselves into a position where we can get the other guys to pay for it or the, uh, the, um, the offshore operators to pay for it or the off onshore emitters to pay for it. The bottom line at the end of the day is whether it's through our gas price, our electricity price, through the products we buy and consume, it will be the citizens of the UK who will ultimately take on the cost of that 
contribution to uh, reducing emissions and uh, climate change. The exact mechanism of how that will happen has still got a little bit of uh, travel to make. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, I look upon this as a waste disposal activity to a large extent. So it, it's quite similar to uh, the way everybody, the, the councils pick up the bins um, and that, that all as our, as citizens have to contribute through our uh, local tax to, to be able to achieve that. Um, so I think that, that's where I am in the, in the situation. But there's, there's room, there's distance to travel there. Uh, just to make a point as well, um, when you're taking on legacy infrastructure, it has to be done by a competent authority or a group of people who have a certain amount of skill to represent the state's interest. You don't want to take on infrastructure that won't serve the purpose efficiently or effectively. Uh, so you can have lots of conversations about which pipelines you take and which rigs might be of use, but you really have to understand that you, <clears throat> you, you want to make a very deep assessment of how useful that will be, because these also come with liabilities. And some of these platforms should be decommissioned, and they are, shouldn't be put forward for longer term reuse. So selecting the good stuff and not the chaff is very important in this process. Just a little bit on scale, um, uh, the, the effort required to do anything remotely enough on climate change, so 1.5, 2 degrees, is massive. Uh, and I don't think we're in a point where we're going to have excess CO2 transport pipelines and excess CO2 storage when you look at the amount we need. So you can either talk about solely industry, maybe some hydrogen, or if you talk about carbon negative, that will also most likely be required, unfortunately. So we're not going to run out of a need for things like CO2 transport and storage. So be it hydrogen CO2 that we put in, or CO2 uh, shipped in from continental Europe, for, let's say coming from cement production, these are key strategic infrastructures that we require. And the fact that we're developing in Scotland means that it becomes something that Scotland can contribute to Europe's decarbonisation. Yeah, I think on the... Hydrogen here is just really uh, an indicative potential future customer. Um, there are other big emitters around thermal power generation and uh, industrial petroleum refining, um, gas processing, and uh, uh, you know the, these these industries will also be producing emissions, which will uh, run through the system. So it's not all about it's not about phase two is entirely driven by hydrogen. Uh, that may be the case, uh, but it's, we feel it's very likely that hydrogen will be one of the customers in phase two. Yeah, I mean, transport of CO2 by ship is a, it's an existing um, operation. There, are, There is um, a small number of fairly small CO2 transport ships that work around the European waters, around the uh, North Sea Basin in particular transporting CO2 for the food and drink in industry mostly uh, and other industrial uses. But um, CO2 is it's usually produced as a byproduct from ammonia manufacture, from the from manufacture of hydrogen four going into ammonia. Um, and there's that's often wasted and vented, uh, but some is uh, collected, um, captured and uh, there is a, a market for, for liquid CO2. And that's moved around Europe by road tanker. It can be by rail tanker, but also by ship. The bulk deliveries from one country to another are obviously by ship. Um, so there are a number of import terminals in the UK. And also there is export from Teesside of CO2 into the European market as well. But the total market is quite small. It's only about, I think, it's about three million tonnes a year in the in the in Europe. If anyone's got a better figure than that, I'd love to hear it because it's really difficult to pin down. Um, so the, the shipping technology is all established, um, but as I say, it's a small scale. So the ships are only of the scale of maybe uh, one or two thousand tonnes of CO2 maximum at the moment. Um, that's not going to be enough to be sort of worthwhile on a climate mitigation scale. So uh, for the Norwegian project, the Northern Lights project, I think they're looking at a sort of 10,000 tonne scale of shipping um, as their larger of two scales of ships. Um, and that or even larger would be the sort of scale that we're talking about for shipping into Peterhead. Um, so the technologies are all there. They're all in existence, all established. There's all regulations and codes uh, for the construction of the, the ships and things like that are all in place. The scale will need some new design of ships, um, but it's not unfeasible. So 
There's some detail. I can give more if anyone wants to hear more. <laughs> I think it's another reason why this location for this project is really, really helpful because it's so close to the harbour at, at Peterhead. And, and I understand that the port have been very on board with, um, you know, uh, assisting and actually quite keen to have more ships coming in and out of the of the port and that. So I think the, um, you know, our, our perspective on, on, on this is that <clears throat> the Peterhead project was uh, a innovative design project for a particular program uh, that was the CCS commercialization competition. And uh, it was one of the final two projects there. So it was highly qualified through that stage. Um, it was built around existing assets that were available at that time, including the platform and the uh, power plant at Peterhead. I think the big difference with uh, the ACORN project is it's not connected to power plant and it is mainly, it's being led by the transport and storage infrastructure piece with just enough capture, almost being agnostic to the type of capture that's used at the St. Fergus gas terminal in order to initiate a piece of infrastructure <coughs> that then can be used by others, both in the region and around other regions. And we're very hopeful that if we can keep the cost of this uh, a low and uh, sensible level, then you know, the cost for other regions to start to decarbonize and send some of their early inventories to ACORN by the ship route uh, helps them get started early until they build to scale and put their own local transport and storage infrastructure in place. Just on the concept of the evolution of the debate around CCS, <clears throat> I think for many years we were stuck in this chicken and egg that will you capture first or will you store first? And that was going on for too long. And a project like Acorn shows that if you take a focus on transport and storage, you can break the chicken and the egg. And then there is no shortage of C2 sources that we can then target after that. Thanks very much. Can I um, thank the panel? Can I thank you all for um, asking the questions? Thanks, everybody. Thank